This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider. This week we're going to continue our discussion from last week on fair housing and discrimination and risks for associations with respect to uh, being sued and or not treating their residents properly. I do want to take a moment and tell you about a couple of shows we're going to have in the uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to have an exciting show about EV charging stations and condos. And we all know that that's a problem because you have guest parking and privately owned parking stalls. And there's certainly a lot of state initiatives to try to uh, force multi-housing units to somehow allow people to uh, have charging stations. So we're going to have a vibrant discussion about what those challenges are and what the future holds for all of us. We also are going to do some discussions about how to deal with hoarders in your association. I kind of call that advanced collecting. It's kind of like you've learned how to collect a little, now you're going to collect a lot, and so you become a hoarder. And I sometimes wonder if my wife's become a hoarder because she, she likes to save everything, but I guess technically or, or uh, clinically she's not a hoarder. But anyway, we have that show coming up, and then we're going to talk some more about fire protection and sprinkler systems and what, what the road in the future holds for where our city council may go, what legislation may happen in the future. So we have some really exciting shows, and we always want to welcome you to join our conversation on our hotline at 808-374-2014. Always interested to have you tell us your perspective, and you're also welcome to contact us about suggested shows in the future. That being said, I have invited my number one guest back. You hold the record of being the guest on my show. I'm the only one who answered the phone, I think. <laughs> Maybe. It could be. But Scott Shirley, who's director of training at Associa, and has been involved in this industry forever, and I'm not going to make you go through the whole thing, but take a minute again and tell them how long you've been here and what you've done and kind of your background so yeah. our new viewers might understand that you, know, you, you can pretend to know what you're talking about. Well, that's a good point. And, of course, 35 years in the industry, um, the last 20, 25 years, mostly in the, the teaching arena, teaching realtors the core courses, which you and I have actually used as a basis for a couple of these shows, and specializing in issues like fair housing, condominium governance, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Those are the areas that I've spent a lot of time with over the years. So we kind of wrapped up last year, last week, I should say, talking about uh, issues on fair housing and risks. There's all these potential, what I'm going to call litigation or disputes that could come up, yep. and there's terms that are used. And the one I would like to focus on for a moment is called hostile living environment. Now, for the longest time, I wondered in my house whether I was living in a hostile living environment. <laughs> Does your wife know my wife? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I have a phenomenal wife, and we're very happy. But I thought it was a good joke to lead into this. <laughs> what the heck is a hostile living environment? Well, a hostile living environment, and of course, people are probably more common with the phrase hostile working environment, but it's sort of the same concept in a condo association or even a homeowner's association, your, your typical subdivision, where it could be an employee of the association, landscaper, resident manager, whatever the case may be, who takes it upon themselves to pick on a particular person or persons at a condo association based on their sexual orientation or their ancestry or anything like that. And when a situation like that happens and it's brought to the board of directors' attention, if the board then chooses not to do anything about it, I've seen cases where they said, well, that's a personal issue. We don't get involved in that. The board gets dragged into it anyways because they have now been advised that there's a situation going on um, and they need to take appropriate actions, especially if it happens to be an employee of the association that's creating that problem. So what should they do? Someone comes to them, an owner says, or writes them a letter and says, I feel this employee, the gardener, landscaper is harassing me or, you know, and because of my race, religion, or whatever it may be. What should the board do? Well, the board needs to investigate, of course, because there's always two sides to every story. And then if they determine that this is actually going on, they need to take appropriate action um, 
depending on how bad the situation is, it might be termination. Um, but it also is a point of education for the board and other owners there as well. I've seen in many fair housing cases that involve associations or board of directors directly, part of their penalty is not only just a fine, but they're required to take fair housing training so that they don't do this again. And some of the examples that I've seen, at least on the mainland, it's usually um, trying to trade sex for something, and, that's, and that it could still be considered a hostile living environment, especially since one of the main seven classifications under fair housing is sex. So um, this, personally, I don't think there's a lot of that going on in Hawaii, but there is the potential of it. Happen. Well, if you're the one case, the one condo that has it happen, you're going to pay uh, either through an assessment or, or a judgment, and it may not be covered by insurance. You know, but, but exactly. my basic but my basic question to you is because when when you start describing that, because board members are lay people, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to my mind is take it seriously and contact your lawyer. That's actually some of the best advice you could give. I've said for years it is better to spend a few hundred dollars now for your attorney's advice than the cost of litigation later. Yeah, because I've seen, we have some really great labor lawyers here, yeah. or, or lawyers who specialize in, in this discrimination type lawsuit. So to me, instead of thinking there's nothing to it, it's someone else's problem, we're not going to do anything about it, or we're going to do it our way, it's so serious and the, and the risk could be so great, it's probably one of those times you might want to consider having a lawyer. And I get a lot of emails, I get say four or five a week from HUD, from the ADA, from the Fair Housing Alliance and other organizations. And the disturbing trend I'm seeing is a lot of states now, remember you have the federal law and then the states have their own fair housing laws. And Hawaii is one of those states where you cannot discriminate based on sexual orientation. A lot of the cases I'm seeing that are involving condos on the mainland is just that harassment because of their sexual um, orientation. Well, it's interesting, in this last legislative session, they, they passed a bill and became a law basically saying it's illegal for a board of directors or its employees to harass, you know, or discriminate or retaliate against an owner. But actually the law prevents an owner from retaliating yeah. against the board member as well. But it's kind of an anti-retaliation board if, for example, an owner filed a complaint. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's certainly a tension to this matter. Have you ever seen a board retaliate against an owner? Actually, I've seen an owner retaliate against a board, or at least the board president, where a decision was made at, at a meeting, and the next morning when the board president went to leave for work, every single one of his tires had nails in it. Not one, but multiple nails in each tire. So it's like you pointed out, it's not just the board, it could be harassment coming right. the other way as well. Well, I've never personally seen that. However, people seem to say that when something happens, you're enforcing a house rule, you're mm -hmm. retaliating, they'll call it retaliation and they'll automatically say, he's doing that because of my religion or my sexual yep. orientation. Whether they're, whether they're doing it or not is not the issue. They're accused of doing it because of one of these protected class type, type matters, you know. And All complaints should be taken seriously, but we also have to realize you got a house rule violation because of the way you parked. It's because of the way you parked. It had nothing to do with your race, religion, et cetera, but we're starting to see that kind of bubble to the surface. You're only doing this to me because, no, you violated the house rule. Yeah. <laughs> and for the record, you know, I have seen one case of retaliation uh, not personally in the sense uh, through my management experiences, but there was a case uh, broadcast throughout Hawaii on Molokai where a board retaliated against an owner and allegedly the uh, resident manager or the manager of the project was retaliating or discriminating or harassing an owner. And, and, uh, and that ended up with a, a significant judgment that was overturned but I believe there was a sizable settlement. So yeah. I'm going to go back to, before we move on to the other next next issue of, uh, re, of discrimination, I'm going to go back and say to it, board should take this seriously. Mm -hmm. And they should get a lawyer and they should get it done independently and neutrally because even if the board is right, 
they're going to be forced into possible settlement and going yep. to classes and and just to find a simplistic way to settle and, and have the matter end. Well, and just to add to that one thing is that a lot of times part of the settlement or penalty is going and taking fair housing classes. Personally, I don't think that's a, 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 a bad thing. They should know these things. They could do it voluntarily by attending fair housing seminars. But it shouldn't be, I don't think attending a seminar on fair housing should be viewed as punishment. <laughs> yeah, and I guess before we move on to the next one, I'm just going to say contact your lawyer. It may cost you a few bucks. But even more importantly, if you're bored, make sure nobody creates hostile environment for anybody. I mean, everybody's entitled to quiet enjoyment of their home and should be treated fairly, realizing that it's possible that someone will try to take advantage of the system, but the last thing you want is to uh, have to spend a whole lot of money on something uh, uh, wasn't a, shouldn't have been a problem in the first place. A whole lot of money and a whole lot of time. <laughs> the other thing I see occasionally boards tell me, well, we're just going to pass a house rule, or we're going to amend our bylaws, and we're going to create all these rules because we want our association to be this way. So we're going to limit the, uh, ch having children, number of children you can have in your unit. We're gonna, they have this view that within this power of governments they have, that they can create whatever, with the owner's approval in some case, declaration, bylaw change, or in the board's case, mostly the house rules, mm -hmm and say, this is how we're going to govern and how our place is going to be. What's your comment? Well, and, and that's a mistake a lot of boards make. And of course, they operate under the philosophy of self-governance. So they think they can make these rules. And what's happened over the years, and it's not just condos, even HOAs have had to deal with this, is if there's anything in your house rules, your bylaws, your declarations, your CCNRs that violate fair housing law, it becomes voidable. Not the entire document, just that section that has it in there. I've discovered recently in a couple of classes that I was doing on the neighbor islands, I have student, uh, one student out of Northern California, just outside of San Francisco, they decided to sell off a large chunk of property that has been in the family for generations. And so they pulled a title report on it and looked at the original deed. And the original deed said, cannot be sold to a person of color. Of course, this is outside of San Francisco, so the target at that time was, of course, the Chinese who were building the railroad and so forth. That doesn't mean that you can't sell the property or anything. It just means that deed restriction cannot be enforced. And you'd be, su be surprised to know that there is actually a property here in Hawaii where original deed restriction said oh, can only be sold to a Caucasian. Well, I didn't know that. But, but I understand the concept yeah. that, that you can't have deed restrictions or private governance in private documents interfere with federal and state law, which is we have these protected, rightfully so, we have these protected mm -hmm. classes. You know, it's, it's uh, sad to see all the events that are going on in the mainland that, uh, that uh, really uh, show we really haven't made as much progress well, as I thought. You know? One of the things that bothered me quite a bit was receiving a phone call from a realtor one day asking me if they could tell the seller that the buyer was a gay couple. And I said, why does that matter? Is there money different color or something? Well, his concern was, he said, well, this particular complex is very conservative, and I don't think they'd like these people moving in. Don't go there. Don't yeah. go there. <laughs> Everybody has a right to buy and live where they want to live. Yeah, that is sad. I would say one thing, it's not really directly related to what you said, but it's kind of a parallel example. I've been in many arbitrations where boards have amended the governing documents and said, for example, the pipes and the concrete that support your unit are your responsibility. Of course, you have no ability to maintain yeah. them because of the fact they're buried in the concrete. And I've seen arbitrator after arbitrator declare moot and void all those provisions because you just don't have the right to do whatever you feel like it. Exactly. It's got to kind of pass a few tests along the way, like <laughs> federal and state law and, and all these different tests that go. But it's not related to discrimination in a way, but it's related to the fact that any governing document, including those that discriminate, are voidable. Voidable, exactly. And, 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 uh, and you don't want to be on the losing end of a voidable contract. Well, and you know, the sad thing is, is my late father grew up in a generation on the mainland where they still had what they referred to as sunset laws, 
where if you were of a certain race, you had to be in your house by the time the sun went down. You couldn't be out on the street. So a lot has changed, but also realize the laws were passed in 1968. So that really wasn't that far back in our history. No, it is. It's true. But we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about one of the most interesting <laughs> and complex subjects, marijuana in condos and a whole bunch of related topics. So we're going to be right back in one minute. You're watching Condo Insider. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big day. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DT. Captain of our team. It's a DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts. But he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm sitting here with Scott Shirley talking about discrimination and the potential risks it has for associations. In the first uh, half of the show, we've talked about um, the issues of voidable documents and trying to pass rules that aren't enforceable. And then hostile living environment, which I guess there's multiple definitions for that, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what day you feel and whether you did the honeydews for your wife or not. You know, that's, I guess that's part of it. But in serious terms, it's much more important to realize that the board has an obligation to protect the people who live yep. there and provide quiet enjoyment. And if you have employees or board members uh, uh, misusing their authority, you can't ignore it. Yep, exactly. But the other one, probably the big topic, is marijuana. You know, and um, when I say marijuana, you know, uh, people who have medical marijuana are a protected class in a way. And What's your take on marijuana? Well, it's an interesting aspect and probably one of the questions that I get asked most in regards to condominium living, and that is the use of medical marijuana. And I would, however, like to point out real quickly that our legislature has said medical marijuana is not the proper phrase. It is not a technical legal term. And based on things that happened in the 20s and 30s in regards to marijuana, and the mainland, they're saying it also has some racist connotation to it. So our legislature has now deemed, at the end of this session, that all documents that reference medical marijuana now must state medical cannabis. So everything now is, we're not really supposed to say medical marijuana, but my feeling is we're, we live in Hawaii. And so it should be medical papalolo. We're embracing the phrase in the sure, state. Sure, it's, it's <laughs> culturally correct. There right? you go. It's and culturally sensitive. And there's some people out there who may remember Don Ho's song from the 70s, Who's the Lolo That Stole My Pacalolo? That's yeah. right. <laughs> so there's some basis for that, but, you know, but the federal and state laws are different, right, on, on well, medical marijuana. Exactly. Number one is on a federal level, medical, recreational, doesn't matter what it is, is still not legal on the federal side. Individual states, there's a number of states that now have made it legal for medical purposes, and some have made it recreational as well. And those states, you are within the guidelines of your state, but you're not within the guidelines of the federal law. And so it's a fine line there. And at any time, the feds could actually come in and say, okay, can't have medical marijuana anymore. But right now, under our state rules, you can use medical marijuana. Wouldn't it be fair to say, I understand the issue of the federal versus the state, 
the state law allows people who have a yep. medical marijuana certificate or whatever it may be called to use marijuana. So a board or an association couldn't deny that based on the federal statute. They would be in violation of the state law. So yep. they, they can't, the feds have to come in and enforce it. The board shouldn't try to enforce the federal law by saying exactly. you, you can't use it when the state law clearly says you can. And I've seen over the last few, five, six years in regards to the legislature, I've been keeping track of this issue for property managers and things like that. And our statute was clarified just a couple years ago that if you, your association is, has a no smoking policy and you use your medical marijuana by means of smoking, they can actually enforce the no smoking part. They can't tell you you can't use it anymore. You just can't smoke it on the property, which means that they would have to take it in other forms, uh, liquid form, uh, edibles, or something to that effect. But they can enforce the no smoking part if they have no smoking rules in effect. See, I have to, t I know you're gonna, don't be shocked at this. <laughs> I come from a very pure environment. I went to a military college in my younger days, you know, and back in the era that this was popular, I was in kind of this monastery of military life that I didn't understand. Is it, is it just as effective to eat it or to take it in a liquid form? Or Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of what they had to do in Colorado, which their most popular form is, of course, in edibles. But, you know, George and Martha, who may not have had marijuana since Woodstock, have now said, hey, it's legal. We can have it recreationally. Let's go get a cookie. And then they eat a cookie and realize about a, 20 minutes later, I don't feel anything yet. Let's eat another cookie. Without realizing that the effects of ingesting it that way take 30 to 45 minutes. And so they just keep adding on and adding on. So the so legislature in Colorado actually now requires how many servings and the time effect that it has on there. So they were overdosing on cookies. <laughs> well, nobody ever overdoses. They just fall asleep. <laughs> but I will point out that um, this is something that not just Hawaii is dealing with. There are other states that have medical marijuana. And for somebody who doesn't smoke cigarettes or doesn't do anything like that, to have that odor creep into their unit does bother some people. So that's one of the reasons that it's not just, they're probably not going to get an effect of it, but they don't like the smell of it, and it can be pretty strong. But we're watching cases in the mainland and see how this is going to trickle down and affect Hawaii. And there was a recent case in the Massachusetts Supreme Court in regards to an employee that was fired because they tested positive for marijuana on the job. The person was taking, and it was a medical marijuana state, they were taking medical marijuana because of their disability. Remember, the marijuana is not protected, but your disability is. So the Massachusetts Supreme Court said that this person could file a case against their employer because of their disability. So they're basically saying he was fired from his job because of his disability. It just so happened he used medical marijuana to help him with his disability. This world is getting so complex, yeah. isn't Well, it? if we're seeing that in the employment side, how long before we start seeing something to that effect on the homeowners association or the condo association? But in simple terms for our audience, if you have no smoking rules in your association, there are legal no smoking rules. Yes. Typically it has to be in the bylaws. It's, you can't have it in a house rule. Then you can enforce on a marijuana smoker. Mm -hmm. You can't smoke, but you can't prohibit them from using any other forms exactly. to, to take it. If you do not have no smoking, then you have to allow them to smoke. However, you might, as you would with cigarettes and or marijuana and or incense, if a person creates a noxious odor or a hazard because they do it so often so yep. much, you may have some rights to engage conversation with them to try to limit that because of the effect on others. Well, and I think you really said it a couple times earlier, you have a right to quiet enjoyment of your place. So if I'm trying to enjoy where I live and it's not enjoyable because of the person next door constantly smoking medical marijuana, you're encroaching on my right to quietly enjoy my place. I know one of our future speakers, you know, because you're my uh, 
host also. I mean, you, you host the show and uh, we kind of take turns. But you're going to bring on an expert on smoking and whether you can smoke on the eyes yep. and all those documents. So a future show, we're going to get more into the, the smoking debate with respect to what you can do, can't do, what you can amend yep. and can't amend with respect to that issue. So in essence, again, when you have this problem, you should probably go to your lawyer. <laughs> exactly, because it's, it's getting more and more confusing what you're allowed and not allowed to do, state law, federal law. And of course, you know my philosophy is, is Hawaii should make it legal for recreational use because Colorado has already collected a billion dollars in taxes. And if we do that in Hawaii, we can pay for a quarter mile of rail. I read today <laughs> in the newspaper, one successful lottery ticket can get you a billion dollars. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, this is because we only had like three minutes left in the show, maybe not, not even quite that, I think. Let's talk about disparate treatment. Well, this, what is that? This new issue, actually it's not a new issue. It's been on the books since the days of um, the fair housing laws and it's called disparate impact. And what that really is, is you create a rule that on its surface looks fine, but the enforcement of the rule has a different effect on certain nationalities. Uh, one of the examples we've used, or I've used many times in my classes, is for, say, a rental manager who has an apartment building for rent and advertises only full-time employed people need apply. Well, on the surface, that doesn't look like there's anything wrong with that. But you can actually be deemed to be discriminatory to disabled people who are not working full-time but can't afford to rent the property. So you've got to be very careful when you create these rules that you're not having an effect. It's actually, uh, it's not exactly on point to what you're talking about, a Supreme Court case in Hawaii where an individual sued because the advertisement in the paper said experienced salespeople need to apply. And the Supreme Court ruled that that's discriminatory because she was a senior citizen, mm -hmm. by the way. So it's kind of on point because of the fact that even though she wasn't experienced, she was a great salesperson. Yeah. And so the word experience took away and was discriminatory against her as a senior citizen. And she actually won that case in the state of Hawaii. Well, one of my favorite examples of disparate impact, and a lot of us remember this in the 70s when it happened, is there used to be this term at the banks called redlining. And what the bank would say is, we're not going to lend in that neighborhood over there because it's a bad neighborhood. It's too high risk. And the federal government came along and said, you can't do that because that neighborhood may have been predominantly Hispanic. And so you've just negated a whole group of people based on a rule that you've created that you thought was a good rule. Well, you know, we're at the end of our show. Oh. And you did an absolutely phenomenal, great job. Such a good job. I'm going to let you be the host next week. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you can get yourself ready and prepare because it's, Actually, it does take some time to prepare these, uh, these uh, educational videos about living in a condo, and uh, we try to make it light and lively and fun when we do it. But uh, we want to thank all of you for watching Condo Insider. Hope you'll tune in next Thursday from 3 to 3.30, and we're going to begin a whole new series of shows. Aloha.